Uh, something to contemplate, I think, on a Sunday. Should Queensland have truth in advertising laws for political parties? Just think back. Think back to the election. Do you remember those big double-page ads in the paper, the ads on social media as well? Uh, They were from Clive Palmer's party. They were hard to miss. They were all about the death tax that Labor is going to introduce. But Labor said, it's all rubbish. They're not going to do it. And yet the ads continued. I was curious about that, so I asked the Electoral Commission what the go was. Do they intervene at any stage? Do they ask for evidence? Do they potentially ban ads or issue fines? Well, the answer is none of the above. As long as the political parties aren't misleading people about the voting process, it seems they can say whatever they like. Now, at the same time, we see social media company company Twitter flagging potentially misleading content during the United States election. So what responsibility do media companies have to identify content that's a bit suspect? Should there be laws around truth in advertising when it comes to politics or should the media police it or is it up to the voter to figure out where the truth lies? To discuss this this morning, I'd like to welcome Ben Oakwist, who's the executive director of the Australia Institute, a think tank, and Graham Orr is a professor of law at the University of Queensland. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Graham. Now, Good morning. Graham, firstly, I mean, that was a pretty rough sketch in my intro about the current rules in Queensland. Have I misled people already? No, that, that, that's pretty right. As Ben will probably say, there is a couple of jurisdictions in Australia that do have uh, truth in political advertising or election advertising. Um, at the national level, we briefly had it in the 1980s. And actually, uh, given your first guest or earlier guest talking about uh, uh, World War One, there was a brief period during the conscription referendum in World War One where there was a similar law brought in. I should say that the media did used to um, patrol uh, misleading political ads uh, on TV and radio and print and billboards, but they vacated the field. And I think the other thing to think about this is, look, it's not just politicians. Um, You have large sections of the media, talkback radio, uh, certain columnists and so on, who will freely campaign at election time, and they would have to be covered, I would have thought, um, if we're going to be non-hypocritical about it. So there, there are laws, though, about sort of truth in advertising if you're a business advertising a, a product, isn't there? So why isn't it e- so easy just to kind of apply similar stuff on the political side, Graeme? Right. Well, we could probably ever, only ever touch the tip of the iceberg. Um, the laws in the state talk about misleading material statements of fact in an election ad. Um, A lot of advertising, and particularly in politics, it's about vision, it's about the future. So, for example, Mr Palmer had that big campaign saying Labor will introduce a a death tax or Labor has a policy to do it. That was clearly wrong. But then halfway through the campaign, he changed it to say Labor could introduce one. Well, a lot of things could happen, of course. So it's it's not going to be something where you're going to be able to eliminate all types of... uh, advertising that is misleading, let alone everything, uh, fake news on social media, uh, press releases, and as I said, ex- what uh, what certain journalists might want to and uh, talk back radio people might want to sprout. Ben Oakes, can you tell us a little bit about the campaign for some kind of regulation of truth in political advertising? Well, yes. Um, as Graham said, it, it, you won't be able to catch everything, but at the moment, it's perfectly legal to lie in a in political advertising and it shouldn't be. There are laws in South Australia and more recently passed in the ACT that make it illegal um, to lie in political advertising. Now this is not um, um, presenting opinions but it's when it comes to the presentation of facts and the law uh, outlaws it in those two jurisdictions. It's only just been introduced in the ACT but it's operated effectively in South Australia for decades. As you say, um, in trade and commerce, it is illegal uh, to uh, present uh, misleading or or deceptive material in advertising, and courts have to rule on it. Of course, um, elections need to be robust and opinion needs to be expressed. Um, The High Court has found that there's an implied right of political um, freedom of political communication, so the laws have to be constructed in a way that they allow that free-flowing opinion, uh, as we should have in a democracy. But the High Court, uh, well, the courts have found that the South Australian laws are constitutional. And in, a, in an era of, as you said in your intro, and in the era of fake news and misinformation, and in a time when uh, voters are increasingly disillusioned with their politics, uh, that really risks, in fact, 
bleeding into a loss of faith in democracy itself. Uh, and unless we put some rules or guardrails uh, around what political parties present, it will only get worse. And there'll be no shared understanding of what the basic uh, facts are that voters need to inform themselves on the way to the ballot box. So I'm curious about the the limits or the extent then of those laws just to use, I don't mind whether we use the ACT or South Australia as an example, but um, as Graham was saying, the, the language shifted slightly in that political advertising in um, this last election campaign from Clive Palmer's party to, from uh, Labor will to Labor could. Does the word could suddenly make it an opinion that would therefore... <laughs> sort of sail through a loophole or is that not enough? Well, it, it, it could. Um, <laughs> um, the South Australian laws uh, and the ACT laws are similar. What they just what they distinguish between is um, is presenting issues of, of, of fact uh, as opposed to opinion. So um, that that's that's essentially the um, defining line, um, and they have to be. Uh, to fall foul of the laws, there has to be um, a, a material uh, misleading um, of uh, information being presented uh, to the public. Now, if you say could or might, and that's clear, well, maybe that would uh, uh, get you out of um, falling foul of the laws. But it's important that we have an independent process that's separate from politicians um, and that is seen to be independent for, for, for the public to judge these things. The, the laws have operated successfully in South Australia. Um, they uh, have required uh, at various times for political parties or candidates to either, rem either remove or attract or both material that's been presented in an election campaign. You need the laws to work relatively quickly so that the material is taken down relatively quickly and the South Australian Electoral Commission, where the laws have been operating for some time, uh, seeks to deal with the complaint initially within two days and then not beyond another two days. But that, but it does rely on a complaints process. It isn't open. It, it's not... Because, you know, I think some, for some it's almost misleading when it says... When, it, when you have the little... Um, uh, disclaimer at the end of a, a TV ad or a um, radio where it says authorised by blah, 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 blah. And it sounds like it's it's authorised, it's approved. Mm, yes, exactly. So, but, but it doesn't, it's not required to be officially approved by the Electoral Commission in South Australia or the ACT in order to get out in the first place, is it? No, the, 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 these systems rely upon complaints. Uh, there, there is so much material um, being presented now to voters. It's believed that if they had to approve everything, it would, it would be just become um, uh, too uh, bureaucratic. It does rely uh, upon people making the complaint to the Electoral Commission uh, in the first place. and um, But beyond that, beyond the complaints process, there's, there's a, a real um, normative effect or a, a powerful effect uh, shaping the political ethics of politicians and political candidates and shaping the practices they, that they use by having such laws. So it's not just the individual uh, complaints. Over time, of course changes the very nature of what political parties and politicians are likely to put forward in their advertising campaigns. So you change the overall culture. And I guess the thing to say is that, you know, we've seen a lot of um, dubious election advertising at state and Commonwealth level over recent years. But with the proliferation of fake news uh, uh, and related material on the internet, it will only get worse unless action is taken. Now, no law is going to be perfect and catch everything. But the reality is unless something is done, it's going to get a lot worse and our very democracy uh, will be threatened. On ABC Radio Brisbane and Queensland, you've been hearing from Ben Oakrest, who's the executive director of the think tank, the Australia Institute. Graeme Orr is here as well, professor of law at the University of Queensland. Do you um, buy that argument, Graeme? Do you think that it's a case of better to do something than nothing at all? Yeah, I've come round to that way of thinking, uh, although to be at least the devil's advocate, there are some uh, issues here. One is these laws do not just capture lies. They, 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 they capture um, things that are reckless or just ignorant. And when you think about it, uh, if you want to have a, a, a more pure deliberation, then you're going to have to have laws like that. So uh, then you have to think about the remedies. Uh, and as, as Ben said, yeah, the best remedy is to get a quick retraction. 
the other question is, well, who will who will decide what is true? Um, and yes, the electoral commissioners. I've talked to different electoral commissioners in South Australia. Some of them do not like this at all. It, it throws them into the middle of very contentious claims and counterclaims in the election campaign when they're trying to um, run a focus on running, you know, a free and fair election rather than resolve disputes. Let's say a dispute about some claim about some economic aspect of climate change that could be very hard to resolve clearly. Um, but as Ben said, I think these laws would have some expressive value and uh, there are countries like South, South Africa, for instance, that have much tougher laws in relation to political parties and candidates. But as I said, and as Ben said, tip of the iceberg stuff, if you're thinking about the amount of campaigning that occurs in different parts of the media, and then if you think about uh, the value of getting a viral meme out or a deep fake out on Facebook compared to the cost of running a Clive Palmer campaign, then I think you know where you're going to put your efforts in the future. And Ben, if you were to, um, the laws, I gather the laws in the ACT are about paid advertising, so that wouldn't stop you from having a rant on your own or your party's um, Facebook page that goes viral through your your followers in a way that's not being paid? As long as you're not paying Facebook to to spread it, it's not political advertising, is it? Well, I think if, if you um, uh, put up a post and you're a political party or a political candidate and you have to have it authorised, even if you haven't paid Facebook to put it up, it's seen as an ad. If, it, if it's got that authorisation tag that you are reading off fast before, yes. then, it's, then, it, then it could be deemed to be a, a political ad, advertisement, regardless of whether you um, pay additional money to get it boosted uh, on uh, Facebook. And that's important because um, you know, traditionally in the past, it's been TV advertising. As Graham said, there used to be a, a, a industry involvement in regulating uh, TV advertising. New Zealand still has a system where the private sector effectively regulate um, for truth in political advertising. So it needs to cover um, uh, social media posts by political parties uh, as well as the more traditional advertising on TV and radio and uh, print. The good news, though, is that um, such laws are politically popular. Uh, we've conducted a lot of research in this issue at the Australia Institute and found that 84% of voters across the country support such reform um, from all political parties. 88% of One Nation voters, for example, right through um, the political spectrum support truth and political advertising uh, reforms. And there has been, um, there, there is some momentum. As I said, the ACT has just passed laws um, at the federal level, the federal review of the election done by the Labor Party, by Jay Weatherall and Craig Emerson, recommended having a look at truth in political advertising. Jason Felinski, the Liberal MP in Sydney, has said it might be a good idea. Zali Stegall, the Independent MP, uh, is looking at the issue also. So I think it's one of those issues that feels like it's a time has come as people are seeing um, just a proliferation of uh, fake news <laughs> being put out by uh, Donald Trump um, uh, to an increasing amount of uh, dubious advertising in Australia. And the, as I said, there's this disillusionment going on with politics. Unless some, some provisions are put in place, you risk a kind of accelerated loss of faith and trust in democracy itself. And Graeme, is there anything to be done about that fake news or the opinions, for, uh, you know, opinion pieces that could include um, misleading or false information from people who aren't political parties? Like, is there a broader media responsibility that ought to be taken, Graeme? Yes, but I, I mean, I really think that has, that has unravelled as the media, as you know, uh, mainstream media has sort of lost its uh, its business model and lost its hold on, on, on the centre, I guess, of, uh, of Australian society. So it, it's very difficult to police when there's so many incentives to just say outrageous things. Um, I mean, that's how that's how certain um, <clears throat> private media outlets uh, maintain their business model now. And then you multiply it 10 times if you're talking about um, uh, Facebook and, and uh, Twitter and so on. And, and whilst they're doing things around the edge, like Facebook was saying, they may not take political advertising in the future in the US. Uh, we see Twitter, you know, labelling Mr Trump's... Um, tweets as disinformation, at least when they go to issues of uh, false allegations that the election was corrupt. 
But, um, you know, you can imagine a situation in Australia, let's say, when, you know, Miss Hanson or some of her ads were, were pulled by the Electoral Commission, that a large portion of her base would, would, would start to claim that the Electoral Commission was, um, was somehow biased uh, in this regard. So I don't think there's any kind of easy fix, but as Ben said, it's, it's, it's got to be a longer-term cultural thing. And we have had a, a text saying, you know, all sides play this game, Medicare, Medicare campaign or, you know, claiming of job losses under a change of government, you know, from the other side. It's... Um, it's something that has been, hasn't it, played around all, all parts of the political spectrum? So, I mean, there was a time in the 1990s where the Hawke government said, why don't we just ban paid TV advertising? And in, in turn, the parties, this is what happens in the UK, would they get several minutes um, where they could only talk about their own policies. It couldn't be attack ads and so on. The High Court struck that down. So we, we, we're caught in this uh, vein, at least in the law, between this idea of liberalism, let things just sweep free, let people say what they want, versus something that might be more deliberative or, uh, or more regulated. And do you think there's any chance, Graham, of Queensland to make a move on this? Is there any appetite for it? <laughs> if Mr Palmer's, uh, whatever, six or eight million dollars he spent at the, at the most recent election in Queensland had, had made a difference uh, and Labor had got back in, let's say, with the Green support, I, I think something might happen. On the other hand, we do find, uh, with some exceptions, as Ben said, the major parties are not fans of this. It tends to be the minor parties who see themselves as not having the same access to the media. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Appreciate it.